everyone, welcome to World Inside, coming to you live from Beijing on CCTV News. I'm your host, Tian Wei. On today's program, Japan's 82-year-old emperor indicates that he wants to step down in his second-ever televised address to the public. What are the reasons behind this move? And we sit down with Chinese-American artist Kai So Kuo as he recounts three decades of major milestones in Chinese culture and history. How far has China come? We begin our show today in Japan. In an unprecedented televised address, Japan's emperor Akihito says he is worried that age and deteriorating health may affect his ability to carry out his official duties. He said in the speech that he could still have problems even if his duties were reduced. The remarks have been widely interpreted as a wish by the 82-year-old emperor to step down. It is the second time the Japanese Emperor Akihito addressed the public, but it is the first time that the Japanese Emperor touched on his role as a symbolic monarch of Japan. I am already 80 years old, and fortunately, I am now in good health. However, when I consider that my fitness level is gradually declining, I am worried that it may become difficult for me to carry out my duties with my whole being as the symbol of the state, as I have done until now. 82-year-old Akihito said it has become harder for him to perform his duties due to his old age. There has been concerns raised that the imperial household has scheduled too many official duties. In 2015, the emperor only had 82 rest days and performed few hundred official duties. However, the emperor cannot abdicate or touch on the issue as it involves the constitution and the imperial law, and the symbolic position prohibits from touching on political matters. According to the public polls conducted by the Asahi newspaper, 84% of the respondents agree on abdication. <laughs> The emperor is old. He made mistakes during ceremonies in the past. If his age is hindering from performing his duties, I think it is about time we can let him rest. It's very exhausting work. I think he has done well to maintain that, and I'm very grateful. I was born in Heisei, and it will be a shame that the name of the era will change, but I think we should respect his wishes. Experts say the Japanese government and the imperial household will debate on the possibilities of submitting a bill in changing the imperial law. I take the fact that the Japanese emperor spoke to the people of Japan seriously. Upon reflecting how he handles his official duty and so on, his age and the current situation of how he works, I do respect the heavy responsibility the emperor must be feeling and I believe we need to think hard about what we can do. The imperial household is reluctant to change its long tradition, but it is looking likely that the world's oldest continuous heritage monarch will see some form of change soon. Terence Teroshima, CCTV, Tokyo. To talk about uh, where the emperor is going, here we have in Beijing, Mr. Liu Yufa, who is a former vice president of the China Institute of International Studies. Welcome, sir. And also in the program, joining us from London, we have uh, Ms. Christine Soraka, who is associate professor in Japanese politics from the University of London. Also joining us from Washington, D.C. in the U.S., we have Joshua Walker, transatlantic fellow at the German Marshall Fund, also a former senior advisor at the U.S. Department of State. Welcome to the three of you. First of all, may I have your explanation, Ms. Sorak. Professor Sorak, I understand you've been doing Japanese studies for a long time, so it helps to understand uh, what has been the tradition of emperors in Japan in terms of the transition from one to the other. Well, historically, uh, abdication has been actually the norm rather than the exception. There's obviously a very long lineage of um, over a thousand years of the Japanese um, imperial family, and in nearly half of the cases, the emperor stepped down, uh, leading to a situation in which uh, usually the son or the heir to the throne was 
um, in power at the same time the previous emperor was also in power. Sometimes that led for a lot of political strife, especially during times of civil war, which is one of the reasons that the Americans, when they rewrote the mm. Japanese constitution, were concerned to um, limit the possibility of abdication. All right. And that is where the interesting thing is, isn't it, uh, uh, Mr. Walker? What do you think could be some of the legitimate concerns related to a transition when an emperor is still alive? Well, in many ways, this is unprecedented. As a previous guest mentioned, you know, this is uh, normal in Japanese history, but not in post-World War II Japanese history. And I think one of the things weighing on Emperor Akihito is the way his father uh, passed away, and there was a long period of dragged out sickness and, and illness that really took the entire nation uh, of Japan into a dark period. And so I think in many ways, Akihito is trying to get out ahead of this. And I think uh, the question is, because the Constitution is the way it is, any change to a Japanese Constitution comes with an enormous set of concerns of its neighbors and also questions about the larger legality of what uh, Prime Minister Abe is trying to do. So I think that's where the concern comes in. I think everybody can expect that mm. an 82-year-old man should have a chance to retire. The question is, what's the precedent being set, and how does the symbol of a nation uh, I I have a connection with the current political process in Japan? Exactly. We've heard the concerns coming from outside, but what about from the Japanese society? We have on the phone briefly with us uh, uh, Mr. Yoichi Shimatsu, who is a former editor of Japan Times. Times. Uh, Mr. Shimatsu, uh, briefly, if you can, understand how the Japanese society is reacting to the message coming from the current emperor. Well, I think the majority opinion is uh, very good of the current living emperor uh, and will regret to see him resign. But, of course, they understand his health problems. Uh, he did go... He's been to many emergencies and risked his you know, life on many occasions, including the Fukushima area after 2011. So there's obviously sympathy with them. I think there's also, however, a hidden agenda among our more pro-militarist forces around Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, who would love to see him go and replace them with someone who would be much more of a powerful, militant, our executive authority to basically undo the Constitution as uh, uh, you know, Prime Minister Abe is currently planning to do. He's mm. trying to change the Constitution. A strong emperor is key to his program. So right. he uh, very, a very uh, tentative situation right now. All right. Mr. Shimatsu, also your analysis about the son of uh, Emperor, Hiro, uh, emperor Hirohito. Uh, what do you make, Akihito, what do you make of his uh, uh, current uh, social status inside the Japanese society and his capability politically when we talk about if there is ever a balance between the royal family and also the current administration? Well, that's a very, very difficult question you ask because, you know, we've had a lot of periods of turmoil over the 20 years since the Tokyo subway gassing and uh, the crown prince was at the time when he was younger seems very very ambitious very supportive of a strong emperor notion he's mellowed in his way and is starting to see his father's viewpoint mm. so that could well be part of the current emperor Akito's uh, uh, decision he would like to basically help shepherd his son into a responsible position in line with the post-war constitution rather than going back to the earlier Meiji era constitution. Right. So I think he would want to rein him in while he's still alive. I see. Uh, Mr. Shimatsu, stay with us on the phone. We are going to talk to you later. But for now, let me come back to the Beijing studio. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Liu, you've been listening to yeah. our panelists from other parts of the world, as well as from Japan itself. What do you make from the Chinese perspective of the recent messages between the royal family and the Abe administration now in Japan? We understand uh, the Japanese em emperor is having uh, a lot of uh, ceremonial f you know, functions to carry out mm. according to his age. I also watched at some functions he did have some mishaps, quote and unquote. Right. So I think he's uh, understood that, you know, he would like to give up his throne 
when he's still in his full capacity, as we uh, our other guests mentioned, mm. so that he could coach his uh, crown prince a little bit before he really retires. Mm. But I think uh, we also notice another uh, line that is political line. Prime Minister Abe and the Japanese government at the moment is bending backward in changing the uh, you know the peace constitutions which was formed in 1947. Uh, you know, emperor uh, was not supportive of that. I think uh, eventually, according to my, what what I understand. Eventually, when the constitution is uh, uh, modified, it, it has to get s to be signed by the emperor. So uh, the government would have to get the endorsement from the emperor. According to the Japanese uh, politics, the current emperor does not want to be part of the process. Mm. Very interesting what you have just yes. said, particularly the latter part. So, Professor Surak, of course, we could take the emperor with his words. Mm -hmm believing that it's all about health issues. But on the other hand, as Mr. Liu and some of the other analysts suspect, it probably also have something to do, to do with the political different views between this emperor mm -hmm. and Emperor Akihito and the current Abe administration. So how should we understand these two possibilities and probably a mixture of these two possibilities? Mm -hmm. Well, on, on these sorts of issues, one can really only speculate because no official statement no, would be course. made. Mm. It is the case that, that his, his health has been um, very much in balance in recent years. He's mm. undergone um, a heart bypass surgery. He's had cancer surgery right. that, you know, very fortunately hasn't so returned. So let, let, me, let, me, let, me let me just ask you a direct question if you are reluctant to, uh, to speculate. If this emperor steps down, will that balance be broken? The balance between the I think royal family, which has been since the Second World War, be pacifist, and the Abe administration, perceived by many around the world as not anymore pacifist, at least. Um, the, the imperial family in Japan at the moment very much recognizes that it's only um, a symbol of state. Mm. If the constitution were to be revised under the current emperor, I believe that he would sign it, even if reluctantly, and if it is to be revised under his son, I think he would also sign it, even, even if reluctantly. Mm. Um, they simply no longer are in, endowed with the political power to have any sort of influence. That said, the emperor has been a very strong force in emphasizing the importance of peace and the peace constitution in Japan. Uh, he hasn't been to Yasukuni Shrine since the 1970s mm. when the souls of Class A war criminals were interred. He even used his most recent birthday to re-emphasize the importance of peace and all of this. And, uh, you know, as Abe has made very clear, he wants to revise the constitution and uh, particularly Article 9. Those are very different political positions. But I think think whether it's the current emperor or his son, mm. they would probably both still sign a new constitution. Right. One of the interesting things is the reactions coming mm. from Prime Minister Abe. He said, uh, Mr. Walker, in a way that uh, his government is going to think about this, think about the possibility that has been raised by the emperor's speech, and yet he stopped short of going further suggesting the government is going to apply to the parliament for the law changes so that the emperor could retire. How much uh, space of imagination does that create for us in terms of the direction possibly to change? You know, I think one of the challenges when analyzing Japan is everything is kind of done behind the scenes. That's so, right. as you said, the emperor has come out and has said, I would like to, he, he never said, I want to retire. He just came out and said, I worry about my health mm. and I want to be able to have all these great things. And as has already been pointed out, this is only the second time he's addressed the nation. He's an incredibly popular emperor, even though he doesn't have much political power. And so I think that this actually complicates uh, Prime Minister Abe because it would be much easier, as the previous guest said, for Prime Minister Abe to kind of change what he would like to change with Article 9 and other constitutions 
Constitution mm -hmm. and not have to worry about the emperor uh, and his status. But now the emperor has thrown a wrench into the plans. And the question is, how will this either work well with Abe's future plans, mm -hmm. or how is this going to complicate it? So I think we have to kind of watch what's happening behind the scenes and what this has in a broader context with the population to be able to understand what will happen next. Mm. There are several things people have been talking about, Mr. Walker. Uh, you know, whether it's a, it's a man or a woman that can be the next generation or the, the generation after the next uh, when it comes to uh, who is going to be the emperor uh, for the royal family. That's one thing, but that's probably the minor side of it. The major part of it is whether the succession of emperor is going to be politically influenced in a way in terms of who will be the next one and what will be the function of the next one vis-a-vis -vis the government even though the emperor and the royal family is only playing a ceremonial role in the Japanese politics but still it is something with a lot of status and whoever is saying something from that royal family will be very much listened and respected by the Japanese society so Mr. Walker what do you make of this reality? You know, I think there's two realities. The reality you, you, you laid out in terms of the political implications mm. of the symbolism of, of this of the position is important, but also the human realities. In some ways, the emperor is the slave to the Japanese people. He can never retire currently. So I think the question of balancing the human condition and the symbolic condition, I don't expect the politics to play that much of a role about who will be the next emperor. I think it's going to be the emperor after the next emperor, mm. because I think the, the question of wh whether you can have a daughter that could step in, who will be picked, right now it's a succession. It's the largest dynasty in the world, there's yeah. a natural heir to the throne. I think that's one of the reasons that Emperor Akihito would like to have an orderly transition in the same way that he enjoyed from his father without the complication of the, uh, of the death and the illness in between. He'd like to kind of see that succession in his lifetime and be able to be a part of that process. Mm. Let's go to Mr. Shimatsu uh, joining us, uh, former editor of Japan Times once again. Uh, Mr. Shimatsu, are you concerned that as Mr. Walker indicated earlier, it is not likely to be a political crisis now, but it could be a concern for future generations of succession if the law is going to be changed, that the political or the administration inside Japan could um, candidate. Well, from my understanding of what, uh, the emperor's tone and what he said, and um, you know, and also years of working in Tokyo as mm -hmm. a journalist. Uh, we had reporters with the Imperial Household Agency. Uh, my impression is that the emperor is basically saying, if the constitutional crisis is pushed further and they do try to ram through a change, he will stay on. He will suffer, you know, in doing so. His health will deteriorate. And it will bring harm to himself, but he's willing to sacrifice his health to fight a constitutional change. Mm. If, however, the ruling party decide to back off and leave the Constitution as it is and stick to the pacifist policy, he can then exit earlier and, uh, and take care of himself. In other words, and so the Japanese people, this is a heavy weight. You're not supposed to disturb the emperor. You know, he's the highest sort of uh, symbolic authority. Mm. So to cause him to be upset to cause, let's say, uh, a heart attack or something like that would be unthinkable. And any politician who pushes the agenda that far mm. would really be uh, uh, ostracized by the Japanese people. I see. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Yoichi Shimatsu, for being with us, former editor of Japan Times. For now, let me go to you, Professor yes. Surak. Um, so, are we going to see the so-called uh, non-movement at this moment, of all the political factors, including the royal family itself, uh, it seems that to be a moment of peace in a way. Nobody's going to move to the second step until the debate is fully done by the Japanese society. Or are we going to see, eventually, very soon, some result coming out of the royal family in its negotiation with the current government? Uh, given your understanding of the Japanese society, what is likely to be the possibility? Well, I, there's been quite a bit of background work that's been done until now. In fact, uh, the emperor had considered making this announcement that he would 
a sort of veiled request for the opportunity to abdicate on his birthday last December, mm. but not enough of the background work and legwork had been prepared at the time, uh, leading to this delay of several months. But I think now that there have been some public opinion polls, there's been probably back-channel communication between the Imperial Household Agency and the Abe government that there's been to some degree a smooth road laid for the possibility that there can be a steady, probably slow, movement forward. I wouldn't expect there to be stasis on this front. Mm. Mr. Liu, yeah. what do you think? Next step? Yeah, the next step definitely uh, in line with the uh, monarch, uh, uh, constitutional monarchy, uh, even the RB administration manages to modify the peace constitution. Uh, whoever in at the throne would have to sign it. There's no problem about it. But I think for the current em emperor, he just wants to make sure that he would leave the throne before the bill reaches his office so that he would not have to be endorsing something which he never liked. But, but th that's his son who's likely to be but the I next think, generation. Uh, to show his personal uh, philosophy. I think. Uh, Are you suggesting he's doing a political threat to the Abe administration no, by doing threat, that? No, not threat, but because of the, uh, the current emperor wants to stick to his, uh, you know, he's a, he he's the emperor. There's no problem about it. But he's also having his personal philosophy with regard to the war, mm. which happened 71 years ago. All right, Mr. So Walker, think, yeah. you see the Chinese guest is very keen in understanding it from a perspective of where Japan is going when it comes to Japanese emperor's resignation or not. Uh, eventually, it was the United States, right after World War II, helped to draw that uh, peace, uh, pacifist constitution for Japan. So will Washington, on the sideline, and what is likely to be the attitude of Washington given the already quite intense neighborly relations going on in Northeast Asia? You know, I think it's a great question. I think that from the U.S. perspective, we don't kind of interfere in the domestic politics. Of course, politics. you don't. I think but back in World War II, it was yeah. a different story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and so I think I think here's a very different situation. And I think the emperor is not only popular in Japan, but I think he's popular all around the world. He is seen as a symbol and the very best that Japan has because of the way that his father, Hirohito, was able to transition Japan from the wartime footing to the peacetime. And Akihito has continued that tradition. And the way he became a real symbol of kind of recovery and peace after Fukushima, I think there's a lot of goodwill in Washington. So I think mm -hmm. whatever the decision that is taken uh, in Japan, whether it's that the emperor will stay on and he will have to sacrifice as the Japanese guess uh, suggested, or what I think is a more likely outcome, uh, which is that he will be allowed to retire after some of the constitutional changes are put in place. Washington will support that. But of course, given how strong the U.S.-Japan alliance is, and given the neighborly relations you talk about closely, and I'm sure Washington and Japan will be talking closely, but not on this particular issue, because it is so sensitive and it is such a domestic issue. I think it's for the Japanese people to make that ultimate decision. Mm. And Professor Surak, before we go, I do want to have your words here. After studying Japan for decades, well, what do you think that we are facing right now? The nature of the Japanese society, including all of these political changes going on, the revision of the pacifist constitution coming from Abe administration and also the emperor trying to bid farewell through one of the very rare public uh, you know, speech he has done and the neighborly relations Japan has having with China and some of the other countries and the rise of China in Northeast Asia. So all of these factors seem to be in a way crystallized for the future of Japan. What is likely, do you think, direction of it? It is indeed a very important juncture in Japan at the moment. I would say that even if the emperor steps down and there's a smooth transition, this will only reinforce uh, the importance of the redefined imperial family in the minds of the people. I mean, this is a very different situation from what one saw in 1945. Um, but he still has a lot of respect in, in terms of his um, attitude towards peace and what he's done for the nation. Abe is a very different is a very different matter. Mm. Um, the economy is faltering. Abe would like to see a major overhaul of the entirety of the econ constitution. Mm. I think those are really the big political stories at the moment in Japan, and which and he, Abe has just won um, an amazing win in the the upper house in Japan. And 
will try to push this forward. So that, I think, is the, the real political story, which could be fundamental change in the way Japan goes forward. Mm. Thank you so much for the thrill of you for shedding more light yeah. on the realities and the prosperity um, and the possibilities of the Japanese politics. Uh, Christine uh, Sirak, uh, Joshua Walker, and also Liu Yofa, thank you so much for being with us. With us here on World Inside, we've got our final segment coming right up. We sit down with Chinese-American musician and writer Kaito Ko for an exclusive look back on 30 years of cultural transformation in the Chinese mainland. What has shaped today's China? You are watching World Inside coming to you live from Beijing. I'm Tian Wei. You can take the boy out of Beijing, but you can never take Beijing out of the boy. That saying is believed to have some truth in the lives of many people. For a metropolitan city like Beijing, people come and go. It's just life. But there's always some who stays in China, becomes part of who they are, and whose departure might mean a legacy for the next generation or even two. Kaiser Kuo is one of those few who has made more than just a ripple. Let's take a look. More than just a rocker. Kaiser Guo, a Chinese-American freelance writer and rock musician, co-founded the rock band Tang Dynasty when he came to China in 1989. Later, in 2001, he built up another band known as Spring and Autumn, which was an ethnic-oriented heavy metal rock group. It was also then that he started writing a column for the English-language magazine The Beijinger, a role that lasted 10 years. In 2007, Guo began taking on top communications roles with Ogilvy. Then he joined Baidu in 2010 as senior manager in public communications. Born in the US, Guo arrived in China in his early 20s, which cultivated a deep attachment to the country. In 2010, Kaiser started The Sinica Show, a current affairs podcast based in Beijing that invites prominent Chinese journalists and observers to participate in discussions about Chinese political and economic affairs. After more than two decades in China with his family, Kaiser Guo has become not only an icon in China's rock scene, but also a figure bridging the gap between China and the foreigners trying to make sense of it. Living in China for nearly three decades and experiencing it as a student, a rock musician, a columnist, and eventually a business person, Kai Sokuo should have a clearer picture than most of what China, about what China is about and also it stands for. I talked to him in the live house where he is and his popular heavy metal band held their farewell concert. The more you get to know China, it seems the more receptive you need to be to its apparent contradictions. You know, to, to, to survive here in China for as long as I have, and, and, and anyone who's lived in China for a long time, whether they're Chinese or American, um, I think they, they, they have to, or, 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 or from anywhere else, they need to be able to hold two contradictory truths in their head at the same time. Give me an example. Um, the ones that I always go to are, for, there's some, some really kind of shallow observations. Chinese are, uh, you can generalize and say Chinese are among the most uh, thrifty and sort of uh, uh, frugal people in the world. They're also some of the most status conscious people mm. and, and the most sort of nakedly materialistic in the world. How do these two things jive? Mm. You could uh, you could say Chinese are uh, the people who are most burdened by history, who, who carry the most baggage of history around with them. But at the same time, Chinese are, as we, we know very well, the people I've seen who are most capable of sudden and immediate reinvention, turning on a dime and becoming mm. somebody, uh, embracing a future. That's extremely interesting what you just said, because I was reading the other day your article, trying to use an analogy of Mr. Zhao to uh, indicate uh, a Chinese mentality toward its tradition and its history and how it has been over the past uh, few decades. Describe to us. Uh, it was supposed to be a sort of meditation on, on, on soft power. And part of, of, of I mean, I, I kind of used this character who in this little parable was living next door to me, mm. a, a Chinese man uh, with no mean accomplishments. He was you know, a very gifted engineer. He had you know, uh, really done great things with his apartment and uh, 
but he, there were a lot of things about him that were impenetrable. And one of them was this relationship he had. I use this as, as a, a fairly on the nose analogy, I suppose, but uh, his wife, who he, he was never in the picture, who he talks about sometimes, uh, he, he divorced from him or mm. had died or, or something like that, but it was always in his mind. Uh, and, and he had a really conflicted relationship with her. Mm. And that's, that's what I was trying to get at, is just that, that le level of conflict. You, he, he could... Um, what kind of conflicting relationship? So he could speak dismissively about her superstitious beliefs and about her you know, reliance on, on Chinese medicine, but at the same time, you know, would constantly, would, would let no one speak ill of her and would have this, you know, had, had this uh, deeply reverential idea about her and her ideas uh, at the same time. This is, China, at the, in, in one breath, you can you can talk about it as having a, uh, a kind of cultural iconoclasm where it just wants to smash any vestiges of what smacks of old, you know, feudal superstition mm -hmm. about it, its history. But at the same time, it it, it uh, is constantly invoking history, often as a, a defense uh, because you, know, you don't understand what's happening. You, you you're constantly wanting to to explain how the gravitational pull of history makes uh, achieving kind of um, escape velocity from it very, very difficult. You need mm. to burn a lot of fuel just to escape its gravitational field. You in and off China for quite some time, until 1990s, the middle of it. Sure. You permanently, at least for 30 years, 20 years, 20 years, 20 20 years moved to China. What was China then? Was that a cultural shock for you because you were here early 80s, very different. Sure, but I, I was also here in 86, and I spent a year here from 88 to 89, and then I was back here frequently during the, the summers while I was a graduate student from 91 through before I moved here in 96. Mm -hmm. and so I, I, it, it didn't really shock me. I mean, the biggest change probably was from 81 to 86. Uh, I think that, that the, the light in people's eyes had changed. There was something that would, a, a switch had flipped. It was very clear. What was switch? I think it was it was what you would call sort of a software switch rather than a hardware one. Uh, there was something in the mentality of people. Um, they they had really uh, gone from from pretty uniform isolation and very little knowledge of the outside world to a real thirst, a real curiosity about what was what was happening in the rest of the world. Uh, the the level of curiosity had had really increased markedly, very noticeably, mm -hmm. and uh, there, there was a, a new kind of uh, a real enthusiasm and, and also uh, a, a marked sense of ambition that had already set in by then. Mm -hmm. And it was clear to me that things were moving in that direction and it would be hard to, to stop that. The momentum had already picked up. What about these periods? Which one or which stage is most significant for you and you think might be most significant for China? Yeah, I think that most people uh, like to point to the period between, say, 2001 and 2008 in that period of, of really rapid change. But for me, I think that the, the really important changes were happening in the 80s. Uh, that's when, like I said, it was sort of, that's uh, what we've seen in, in the period since. A lot of it is hardware. A lot of it is, is you know, the gigantic infrastructure projects and, and you know, all these new gleaming glass towers and the conspicuous wealth that China had accrued since then. The but, hardware. Right, the hardware. The software, though, was the more important part. I mean, the mentality of people. Um, and that was something that changed in the 80s. In the 80s, as you remember, I mean, it was a time of particular cultural and intellectual ferment. I mean, people were, were talking about really important issues about uh, uh, the identity of, of China's place in the world, about uh, systems of government, about all, all sorts of, of, of I mean, there were gigantic debates raging mm -hmm. in, in that time, and that was a very exciting time to be here as a college student and as, you know, uh, somebody who recently graduated from college. Some describe it as naivety. Others say it is innocence. There are also people who describe it as inspirational, that period of time. What would you say? I would say all three are true. I think there was certainly a good touch of, of okay, uh, nothing contemptible about that, nothing at all. I mean, uh, but also, yeah, I think that it, it was uh, also a, a period that was very inspiring. I think that, and, and for those very reasons, I think that, that part of the, the reason that it was so inspiring is that be, because people uh, were so earnestly looking uh, to define a new future for themselves in a, a, a very changed world emerging 
from a long period of, of, of virtual isolation from the rest of the world. Whether it's the pride or the dismissal, do you think it is the thoughts that people would have after they study their own history? Or this is a, a pretty much official rhetoric that people picked up through their early years and become part of them? Right. I think that, that it's very easy for people outside of China to overstate the effect of patriotic education or, or things like that. And there's no question that there's an awful lot of that. Um, I, mean, you know, I, I see, see my own children, even though they're in an international school, they still, you know, bring home homework assignments and things like that that I, I see contain this stuff. You know, it's in the popular media. You know, you see in, in recent years so many re-airings of old uh, movies about the, the, the Japanese war, uh, recently about Korea, things like this. I mean, the, the history has its instrumental purposes for sure. Uh, whether that, that uh, Results in just you know sort of a brainwashed or a, a propagandized generation. I don't I don't believe that it, that, that that it can be chopped up entirely to that. I think that there's something else that that uh, you know comes from uh, the, the way that all of us, no matter where we are, absorb history. It's in the air around us. It's it's in in, in, in the artifacts that we see. Uh, it's it's it emerges in conversations with other people who aren't in a position of sort of pedagogical or political authority. So, it, you know, I, it's both. But people would argue whether you have been brainwashed. Yeah, sure. I think there are probably a lot of people who do. Um, and I, I, of course, nobody believes that they've been brainwashed. But I mean, I, I think it would be disingenuous to say that, you know, we escape influence, you know, from, from the, the environment that we're in. Uh, of course, because I have a lot of friends who are Chinese and who, who, who represent to me the Chinese perspectives on a lot of things, my family members and things like that, of course I'm going to absorb a lot of those. But I'd like to think that uh, what, I, what I try to do is not to embody those ideas, but to mm. sort of channel them. To, to, I think it's important that people understand how, how Chinese people themselves understand their own historical legacy, and mm. how the relationship, the fraught and complex relationship they have. If you don't understand that, you're missing an awful lot about, about China. And if you just write it off as a result of propaganda and of brainwashing, then you, you're, you're missing a big piece of it. Kaiser, when I was listening to you just now, I suddenly came up with this question. I mean, there are very few people like you who can live in China for such a period of time continuously well, and play so many <laughs> roles and play okay. so many roles inside the society observe the changes of the cultures and the society and also play a part in the changes of cultures and the general societies. Are you lonely from time to time? I mean, many of the things you're thinking about, sensing, probably it's very hard to share with most of the others. I wouldn't say I'm ever lonely. Um, I'm frustrated sometimes. I think it's, it's very difficult to do this. Uh, it's a really fine line that you, you want to try to walk. Um, you're trying to inhabit kind of uh, two civilizational identities at once and trying to channel uh, the thinking uh, of the one and represent it to the other. And in most cases, it's representing, uh, trying to, to, to help Westerners understand how Chinese people think. And you're, you always run a lot of risks. You, you, you risk looking like you're not just explaining, you're, 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 you yourself hold those ideas. And I do not. In most cases, I do not. I, I, I'm really, but I, I think that what I have developed is a strong sense of empathy. So sometimes it's frustrating in that in that way. You're always going to be regarded with some suspicion. I mean, I, uh, for every time I get called a shill of the Communist Party or, or <laughs> a, a fifty center, I'm also being criticized constantly for being sort of a tool of the, the West, of, of Western imperialism, or whatever. So uh, I figure if I'm getting you know attacked from both sides, I'm probably doing something. That's interesting. But it's not lonely. I think there are a lot of people who, who, who try to do the same thing. I have a, a real strong community of people who I feel very allied with in that, in that regard. Who is Kaiser Kuo? I mean, I'm confused. Even after talking to you, probably even more. Who is Kaiser Kuo? Yeah, he's just this guy. This guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's just this guy, you know. Um, I, I, I'm just interested. Uh, I'm a guy who uh, uh, I think I, I'm somebody who's been very much defined, uh, certainly in the last 20 years of my life, by one mission, by one calling. I want to be uh, a bridge builder. I wanna, he is, Kaiser is uh, somebody who, who is uh, determined to build bridges of cross-cultural understanding uh, to help the one side, 
to empathize better with the other, mm -hmm. and, and ideally in both directions. You have a good box of tools, Kaiser? Not sure. It's, I'm, I'm up to it. Um, I, I have a few tools. Uh, hopefully, they'll, they'll, they'll be up enough for the job. Kaiser Kuo, we're going to miss you. So we're come back you often. I will. I will. <laughs> and we'll see you when I come back. Yes. Thank so you good coming. to see you. Thank you so much. All the best. Thank you. And that is all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more of our program, visit our website. Just type in World Insights CCTV News into your search engine. You'll be able to find us. Or you can also check out our YouTube channel. From me, Tian Wei, and everyone at the World Insight team, thanks for watching. And tune in again tomorrow for more insights from across China and around the world. Good night.